The topic for this first discussion is uh, working boat yards and shipyards and museums. Uh, this is a, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I did not start my career as, a, uh, as an academic. I was a shipwright and painter in the shipyard at Mystic Seaport in 1982 and 1983. Uh, and after getting a PhD, a professorship, and an international career working in museums, I found myself for the last two weeks before I came here scraping and painting an old boat in that same shipyard. I guess that's progress. Um, having, a having a shipyard, a working shipyard or boatyard as part of your maritime museum seems in many ways like an obvious no-brainer asset uh, to have as a way of engaging the public, engaging people, providing a living exhibit, not just things in cases uh, for visitors to see. It's a way to present process, not just result. Uh, however, there are as many different ways to do that as there are museums. Uh, each of our uh, panelists here, uh, after uh, Shane Thunison, uh, runs a, program, a working boatyard in some sense, or is about to, uh, that uh, is connected to their museum. And each presents very different challenges. And I've asked each one to concentrate a little bit on the particular challenge or advantages that they see with their program. But to, uh, but to start, I'd like to ask Shan, uh, Shane Thunison, who's assistant professor at Mount St. Vincent University and works with the Museum of the Atlantic, to give a more general introduction on what sort of possibilities a shipyard presents to a maritime museum. Is that fair to say, Shane? Very much. Should I come up here to speak? Uh, uh, you can either sit there if you like, or you can come up here. Uh, yeah, I'd like to sit here next to you. Yeah. All right, uh, great. Do I need a clicker to be able to move Yes, you do. Slide? I see someone waving at the back there. Can you hear me? We're, we're making sure that you have pictures. OK. Um, so just to give a bit of context from where I'm coming from, uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm originally from South Africa. Um, my family, when I was 18 years old, sailed a 36-foot sailboat from uh, Cape Town, South Africa, to Toronto, Canada. And that was sort of my, my real introduction to being on the sea and part of the sea. Um, I've, I subsequently trained as a commercial diver, and for those folks from the UK, I have a yacht master with a uh, commercial endorsement, which allows me to sail 200-ton commercial boats. But uh, that was all before I went to university. And uh, I, I, I went to university at, at the age of 24, I'm quite excited to learn some new things and, and you know, be challenged in the world of creativity. And I was quite disappointed when I arrived there. And part of that was the lack of engagement with the actual lived experience of students. And I've, I've carried that with me as I've moved through my academic journey. And which finally landed me at the Mount, as you heard, as an associate professor in child and youth study. And uh, I did my uh, master's degree in apprenticeship learning models and uh, did my thesis on working on small scale fishing boats and the, the process of learning to gain membership in that community in Barbados. Um, with that knowledge, I, I was given a, um, a new scholars grant and was looking around for an opportunity to expand the narratives around which learning and belonging could happen. And I was fortunate enough, I can't see the slides there, but maybe if I fast forward, I'll say learning narratives. Does that say learning narratives? No? Yeah? Point, point at this and press the button. Oh, there I can see. Okay, there we go. Um, so alternative narratives about learning. And um, I was very fortunate. I see Eamon Dawley on the side there. Uh, I was able to give him a call, and he doesn't like to be referred to as the master boat builder of the Maritime Museum, but as often as I can, I do refer to him as such. And him and I headed off and started having conversations around what we could do to support youth and youth learning and youth engagement within HRM and Nova Scotia more broadly. 
And it was through sort of our dynamic partnership that we started to explore opportunities to engage youth and, and students from the university in opportunities that really challenged the dominant narratives around learning. So that's one of the key facets of the relationship that we had. Now this was beneficial to me and the university in that the university you know, like many institutions, is struggling for relevance. They're looking to be able to apply the learning that's happening in the institution and how that may be able to relate to spaces in the lived experience of the participants of the community. So um, experiential learning, um, engagement with community, community support, and particularly knowledge dissemination. And I know that uh, Kim Reinhardt, showed a video this morning with uh, new immigrant Canadians building boats. That's part of the knowledge dissemination process that's vitally important for universities to be able to actually highlight some of the things that they've been talking about and doing. And democratizing access to that knowledge is vitally important. So from the get-go, making those videos was a pretty important component to the boat building process so that we could start telling stories. Because I often think about the ongoing narrative about who new immigrants are, or who students are, or who knows what, as a story that's perpetuated and told. And if we can perpetuate different stories, then people are able to tell different stories about themselves and as a consequence of that, reconstitute their identity, which is another one of the key facets that we have there on the board. Um, and then one of the other things there, I've jumped over it, is facilitating intuitive understanding. Um, as I mentioned, I had a lot of uh, lived experience, and particularly ocean experience, prior to going to university. And I carried a, a lot of information and knowledge with me. And one of the things that I've noticed about institutions and learning generally, whether it's from kindergarten to you know, PhD, is that there's a divorce between informal knowing and formal knowing. And, you know, I've, I've got in my notes this idea that intuitive knowledge or this knowledge that's gained from experience as being delegitimized within the broader constructs. And part of that is to sort of perpetuate power struggle, or power dynamics that have long since gone by, by the way. I have two books here that I think are particularly interesting that sort of have been insightful in terms of some of the, the thinking and discussion that I have. The one there is called Cognition in the Wild, and that really speaks to the idea of learning in context. And the boat um, uh, shed, or the, the, the boat uh, yard, if you call it, um, is definitely one of those contexts that you learn from. It has a pace. Even Eamon and I were talking before, um, at lunchtime today, we were talking about you know, the heat in the boat shop in the wintertime and how we actually learn from the context itself, whether it's the weather or it's the, the, the tempo of the space that you're in. Okay. Have to and, wrap it up now. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Um, so a lot of that, um, when we tie it into a way of being, we can think about um, opening and offering opportunities to students to be able to enter into that space. Um, one of the things I talk about is lowering the cost of access. And the one thing that I have to talk about, and I'll just force forward it there, sorry, um, is about making knowing simple. And the boat, when you saw the Bevan skiffs being built, those are boats that get built in three days. And when we think about lowering the cost of access to allow people to come into that community, we're simplifying the process. And it's a frail bridge of trust, because you heard some of those people talking about the courage that it required to be able to enter that space of the unknown. Anyway, I overspoke and I uh, apologize for that, but hopefully we can address some of the uh, queries and concerns during the question period. Thank you for your thank, thank you, Shane. Uh, and I'm sorry, asking anybody, any academic, to speak for less than 40 minutes is, <laughs> is just cruel and inhuman punishment. Um, but something you said uh, I would like to comment on. Um, Samuel Pepys, writing in the late 17th century, because he was a person of formal education who was very interested in the informal knowledge held by shipwrights. 
commented that about specifically about shipbuilders and shipwrights, their knowledge lies all confused in their hands. Um, specifically, that it was essential knowledge, but not knowledge that was either that was taught or transmitted in a formal way. Would you like to comment yeah, on that? I'd love to. Um, I'll just speak loudly. Um, so the the book that's up there um, that I had called Shopcraft as Soulcraft. That's actually written. Um, by a chap who struggled with the formal processes of learning, but really was talking about the agency that one can develop in being able to fix things themselves and to actually manipulate materials themselves. So he actually spoke about a broader sy uh, systemic process where um, this divorce was happening so that, you know, everyday people aren't able to fix things anymore and we lose some of our independence as a consequence of that. And he actually highlighted that, um, you know, when we think about PLAY, the, there's a little acronym that we have that the, the P in PLAY stands for problem solving. So when you're working in the boatyard, it's actually an act of play because you're you engaging in that first piece of the acronym, problem solving. And not all problems have a single solution. And that's why the, the, the knowledge lies confused in their hands because not all the answers are the same. And there's actually an idea of divergent testing where you test problem solving capability and yeah, they don't have a direct answer for something because the direct answer doesn't exist because a boat is really a consequence of compromise. And th they, those boat builders wouldn't have a direct answer for something because it was all gray. Great, thank you. Um, now let's hear about some actual boat building programs or shipyard operations connected to museums. Uh, Kristen Greenaway is the president and CEO of the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. I think everybody, you have, you've probably talked to everybody in the room by now, I'm guessing. So no, inter no further introduction necessary. If, if you I would haven't, tell, I will be there. <laughs> so please tell us about what's going on at CBMM. All right. Thank you, Fred. Uh, this will give you an idea of the shipyard. We're at 18 acre, about seven and a quarter hectares. Uh, and a, this is actually an expanded uh, operation. It used to be a boatyard, and now it's a shipyard. Uh, we have uh, great resources. We certainly do not have the resources that my colleagues at, at Mystic have, uh, but we are a shipyard that, of course, is accustomed to looking after not only our own floating fleet. We have the largest collection of Chesapeake Bay watercraft in the world, about 90 or so vessels and a floating fleet of about 14, 15 vessels. And of course, number one is looking after our own vessels, shallow drafts, so they can fit on the marine railway there. And also we uh, have access to lifts that we can use as well. Uh, a key part, which really follows perfectly on from you, Shane, a key part of our shipyard is this is our living, breathing exhibition. We have other exhibition space, and my chief curator, Pete uh, Letcher, is here, who can speak with any of you about this. Uh, and, but a key part, this living, breathing exhibition that we have is based on education and the transfer of traditional skills, which is a real challenge, not just from a North American perspective, but an international perspective. But where do you start? You've got to start at the very basics, the, the young children. Uh, that, uh, that you need to do. So our Rising Tide program, I've been at the museum now just over eight years. This program started eight years ago. It started with me going to the local chief of police and saying, what can we do for you? He said, no one's ever come from the museum to ask me that question. If you can help me keep children, youth, off the streets after school and in the summer holidays, we'll be best mates. This is how Rising Tide started. So we take sixth graders right through, that's about year seven, uh, and we started off, we, st we give you a set of tools, you make your own toolbox, you take that home, and you can be useful. You can say to your parents or your grandparents, I can fix that. And then at Christmas, you make lots of Christmas presents, and you get very proud of the fact that your parents, your grandparents are using your chopping board or your oven puller or your plant holder. Uh, we teach them how to build boats. We teach them how to solder, weld, how to repair a bike so they don't have to borrow someone else's bike and it ends up in our harbour. 
Uh, we, it's, it's, they've made skateboards, they've made stand-up paddle boards, which at a local auction for our gala sold for 14,000 US dollars. And uh, it's, this is the beginning. So my, my passion, my vision for this was that these children have an opportunity to go forward into any apprenticeship or they could be sparkies, brickies, carpet layers, you name it. They could even be shipwrights. So we found it, the museum for many, many decades has had a shipwright apprentice program, but it's based, it's more of a grunt program. You had to have graduated from Wooden Boat School, Iris, another boat building school for, you'd have to be there one or two years. But now our program, and this is a fourth year, we are now certified uh, by the state of Maryland and recognized federally as a full shipwright apprentice program. It's four years, 8,000 hours, and it's based from just you know, full tools right through to how to manage a, a business, how to use P profit and loss, accounting, museum management, working with people in the public, because that's what we are. We are working any time a member of the public can come in uh, to the shipyard and say, what are you doing and why are you doing that? So a key part is not just the restoration of our own vessels. So the big project that we've completed recently, which brought so many more people to the museum and such an incredible training opportunity for everybody, was a $5 million contract we were awarded by the state of Maryland about four years ago to build a new reproduction of Maryland Dove, the one of two vessels 1632 built, 1634 brought the first European settlers uh, to Maryland. Uh, this is the stem, here's the very first frame. There it is lifted uh, on probably the most coldest day that we had uh, that winter. Uh, that season lifted into the water the, and here it is sailing into St. Mary's, historic city of St. Mary's to be commissioned by its client. Uh, this really is the culmination of everything that we've been working toward. We are, we are not in the competition of Mystic to be a commercial yard, but we are now actively, and I say this for all of those who are out there, we are now actively looking for com additional commissions. Uh, we actually have two on the books at the moment. We've just started another one, uh, and, uh, and we continue to, to give people an opportunity of all ages to be a part of not just working in the shipyard or as a rising tide youth, but to come in and join our programming. We do foundry work, uh, you know, green molds, etc. cetera. We, we make things, we help people discover the joys of building and making and maybe not taking something home if, as, a, as an adult, but putting it inside a vessel like Dove and it's there for as long as that vessel is still floating. You are a part of living history and you're a part of doing good and making good. Perfectly tidy, I love it. Yeah, I, have, I have a question for, for Kristen uh, and that is um, because you have uh, effectively some competing interests here, mm. there's always the question, and that's true of every shipyard, is there is, is the question of integration and balance. To what degree is your shipyard, shipyard operation driven by the educational imperative, and to what degree is your shipyard operation driven by the maintenance construction imperative? It's a uh, mutual beneficiary. Uh, beneficially uh, to each other in that regard. Number one, our mission is education, so that must always come first. If one can make a little bit of money on the side for that to help balance uh, earned revenue, increase earned revenue, then one will be very, very happy. So there is that element as well. We are, the shipyard, we, our plan is actually in three to five years, we are hoping that the shipyard can be self-funding. So, but would you turn down a project if it didn't fit your educational goals, even if the money was good? <laughs> For those who know me, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that will lead us on to our next uh, presenter. Chris Gasorik is the Senior Vice President for Operations and Watercraft uh, at Mystic Seaport. Uh, and he'll tell us a little bit about the extensive operation there. 
Excellent. Thanks, Fred. I'm glad you mentioned that last week you were uh, under the bottom of the Kelmar Nickel painting in that same shipyard where you started, because I was going to make sure to mention it, for sure. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, I think for, for many of you who have been to Mystic Seaport Museum, you have seen our shipyard. We're celebrating the 50th year of that shipyard, uh, even though it is on the site of a previous historic shipyard. So it's a, a location at our museum that has been doing that type of work uh, for a very long time. Um, when the shipyard was started, it was in connection with the uh, rising collection of uh, National Historic Landmarks and large uh, vessels that are part of our collection, and the idea to be able to work on those, maintain them ourselves, show our visitors that experience, rather than pay someone else to do it. Uh, that went for uh, many years with a few outside uh, lend a hand to another organization projects. And over the last few years, we've expanded that into, uh, as, as we've said, more of a commercial operation. Uh, trying to balance that with uh, maintaining our own vessels. So a little overview of our, of our shipyard. Actually, that photo is uh, the uh, Mayflower II, which was a four-year restoration, a uh, really complete rebuild of that vessel following on the uh, restoration of our own Charles W. Morgan. A uh, little overview. Actually, there's the uh, Kelmar Nickel uh, hauled out on our 580-ton uh, uh, marine ship lift. Um, a couple other projects that are in there, sort of a, a great mix of uh, inside and outside projects. In the foreground is our excursion vessel Sabina, which we are uh, doing some restoration as well as adding electric power to it, which is a, another interesting conversation. And astern of that is a uh, 1924 built, uh, Mystic built oystering vessel that is uh, in commercial operation, wooden hull, built in Mystic, and uh, operating today commercially where it's just commencing a uh, after section of the boat rebuild um, as we speak. So sort of a mix of the types of projects that are there. The Kelmar Nickel is uh, just sort of a short haul out, inspection, paint, uh, some caulking work and a little bit of carpentry. But uh, the other two are, are longer term projects and we try and mix up that and keep, keep the yard busy both uh, restoring our own vessels, maintaining our own vessels as well as commercial opportunities. And if you're thinking, well here's a little overview on uh, the shipyard. We have three sawmills, we have uh, several shops, we can do mechanical, we do um, of course lots of woodwork, and a partial list of some of the vessels we've recently worked on, um, which ran the gamut. I think the most interesting recent project that we just completed this summer was uh, putting a new deck on the USS Nautilus, the world's first nuclear submarine. Uh, so a bit out of our uh, normal wheelhouse, so to speak, but a very interesting project and uh, great. We actually just had the re recommissioning of that in its museum space with the governor and senators uh, who all spoke about you know, Mystic Seaport having done uh, a chunk of the work for the Navy. Uh, a few things on uh, looking at my slides there. So what, do you, what can you get of having a very busy, very commercial shipyard? Um, visitor experience. I think uh, a neat thing there is uh, ship repair, shipbuilding is such a giant part of our economy, but uh, no one really gets to see it. Just a few miles away from Mystic Seaport Museum is Electric Boat, which builds nuclear submarines for the U.S. Navy. If you go up to the gate and say, hey, I'm interested in how you build your ships, uh, and maybe take a picture, you're probably going to get a small room somewhere for a while. Uh, but you can come to Mystic Seaport, walk uh, closer to our sawmills than our insurance agents would sometimes like, uh, speak with our shipwrights, get uh, right into where the sawdust is flying. And while it's different than building a, a submarine, uh, the concepts are the same, the way you plan and execute a project is the same. And uh, you know, seeing the Kelmar Nickel out of the water is, is pretty formidable, even if it's not a, a giant ship. So you can really, really bring our visitors a scene of what is a, a large industry that takes place in our countries, uh, mostly out of sight. Uh, there is some potential financial benefit. Or actually, we're on risks, aren't we? And the screen's over there. Um, there are some risks involved in the uh, operating a commercial shipyard. Um, lots of people using lots of sharp tools is a safety issue, and that gets interesting with insurance. Uh, we also have forklifts and heavy machinery moving amongst our visitors, so very close training, uh, safety management systems with our staff. have uh, We've had very good luck lately in that regard. Uh, financial risk, uh, some of these projects, um, you know, we try to vet uh, outside projects to make sure that they're able to uh, pay at the end of the project. 
Uh, but we also work with a lot of other organizations that are uh, sometimes running on the edge and we might be the, the link to keep them running or not. So we, we try and balance those two, two things. Um, so there are risks involved, as well as uh, other projects like working, we've done some government projects when the government likes to have fixed bids for uh, ship repair, which we all know when you get into opening up a ship, you always find more work. So uh, there is some financial risk in, in doing some of those estimating. So there's a lot of uh, business side to, to make this, this work out. Uh, the opportunities, as I mentioned, visitor experience, uh, tying visitors into what's happening, the ability to maintain your own vessels at a reduced cost, as well as um, having the facilities and the staff that help us do other projects around the museum is also excellent help. Let's see where we go and speed up. I think that is it. Um, it's, it's exciting. We have a lot going on, a lot of activity in that area, and uh, would look forward to showing anyone around what we're doing if you're in the Mystic area. Thanks very much, Chris. I can testify to that risk element. One of the first jobs I had as a shipwright was on the prior restoration of the Morgan, stripping off the upper deck of three inch thick fir planks while visitors were walking around on the deck below. <laughs> and the, the commitment to keeping the, ship, the shipyard and the ships accessible while they're being restored is interesting. But I have a question for you because one of the risks of operating a commercial operation in a shipyard, which is great, I, at the time that Calmer Nickel decided to start its relationship with Mystic, I was on Calmer Nickel's board. And we were looking for a shipyard that could do work on our vessel, and we were very happy that we could pay another nonprofit to do that work rather than a commercial yard down in Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, but to what degree do you have to, the, the key here I think is going to be how do you achieve balance again? If you, start, if you take too many external paying contracts, you have to start deferring maintenance on your own collection to, to take on those contracts. How do you maintain the balance so that the commercial work generates a sufficient surplus in finance, financial surplus that you can pay for work on your own collection, and how do you free up the human resources and shop space to make sure you're still looking after your own collection? That's a great question, Fred. The, uh, the interesting, you know, we're celebrating our 50th year of our shipyard currently, and in the earlier days of uh, higher visitation and different staffing models, it was able to really, the museum through operations able to maintain a full staff of, of shipwrights. Uh, recently, uh, through financial difficulties and COVID, it's been more difficult to do that. And I think today we're able to maintain a full service, full staffed, a uh, group of shipwrights and support staff that are able to both work on our own vessels as well as outside vessels. Um, has that solved deferred maintenance? Uh, no, I think in our, in our world that's, that's kind of always out there. Um, but it does let me have the staff, and we try and alternate between an internal and an external project, uh, but it does let me have the staff available to do any work necessary on our own vessels. Great, thanks a lot. Um, now, <clears throat> Alan Edenborough is the director of projects for the Sydney Heritage Fleet, which includes the maintenance of historic vessels uh, in their collection. Alan? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I feel as though I'm in um, a rather proud uh, company here. Uh, we are very much a small organization by comparison to Mystic and, and Chesapeake Bay and uh, Great Britain. Um, but we soldier on. We've been going now for 57 years. Most people don't know that. And our basis of operation has always been uh, to work with volunteers. Uh, it's a nightmare in terms of management. I would not suggest you ever set up a corporate organisation based on, on volunteers. But in terms of actually running a shipyard, it works. Um, because what we have done is to Start, we started off with two very large shipyards in Sydney, which are subsequently closed, and we were able to attract many of the workers from there to come and join us uh, and, and work uh, as skilled labour to train other people. And that's been the ethos. Skills training, skill passing on skills is very much what we do. And just to give you an idea, and I imagine that's come up, 
Who would be mad enough in this world to take on that ship sitting in a, a bay in the southern reaches of Tasmania, almost impossible to reach by any other way than water? Who would take that on and try and restore it? Well, we did, a bunch of idiots that we were. That's James Craig in 1972 when I first saw her. And we were able to, by long years of restoration and quite a lot of money, we were able to restore her to the, the view that she is today. And uh, if I've got the slides right, that's, that's James Craig, currently operational. She's one of only four uh, 19th century restored ships, and she sails regularly. James Craig goes out with passengers uh, at least every two weeks. She does a lot of voyages, and she's been sailing now for 22 years. She's about to come up for her midlife refit. But it is all done with volunteers. The crew's volunteers from master down, and we operate that model, and it, and it does work. The, uh, it goes right down to, uh, I think I should have a spa there. Do I have a spa? Yes. <laughs> to actually, we just, we've just taken the jiboom off. The jiboom needed to be replaced. Totally done by volunteers. Skilled people working with untrained people who are trained on the job. So they come away with a, with a, a knowledge on how to, to handle timber, how to work with, with rigging, and, and they are then skilled people who continue on to the crew and hand on their knowledge to other people. Uh, we are not a, a registered training organisation, which is the equivalent of, um, of what Chesapeake have, but we do have recognition by the government uh, as a skilled training uh, organisation. So people will still be sent to us, but they don't go away with certificates because the Australian system is incredibly complicated to set up uh, the legal requirements for a registered training organisation. So what we do a, a lot of is to train people, take them through the exams at the end of the training, uh, and then hand them over to a, a registered RTO who does the formal qualifications, and they will put them through a series of, of, of further exams, and if they qualify on that, they get their certificate or whatever it is. We do run the only STEAM training course in, in Australia. Some of our volunteers come to us quite unskilled and they get quite simple jobs to do. There's somebody just uh, uh, um, varnishing blocks, for example. But they learn about the ship, they learn about things that, that need to be done on the ship and they gradually get the knowledge that works them through the crew and with the training uh, a, a master with them, they'll, they'll eventually be given more responsible things. We make our own sails. Uh, that's a huge job. That ship carries, James Craig carries 21 sails. Um, we're replacing them gradually as they wear out, and that's been a, a learning curve again to be able to do that. But we have skilled sail makers, and uh, they're passing on the knowledge to other people. That's the, that's the, the, the sailing side of things. We also run uh, a separate shipyard. Unfortunately, we don't have the facilities of either Mystic or Chesapeake Bay. I drool every time I go there and wish that we did. Um, Sydney Harbour. Uh, used to be a, a big working harbour. Sydney Harbour now is a residential playground. Um, every time there's a, there's a, a commercial uh, yard, comes up wanting to do something, there's a challenge from the residents, all of whom bought their properties overlooking a shipyard, but that doesn't matter any longer, you complain. We've just had one of the shipyards that has always handled traditional vessels, including ours, um, has just been told that uh, their lease is not going to be extended because the residents have complained. They don't like the noise, they don't like the idea of a shipyard in Sydney Harbour. The fact that it's been there since 1853 doesn't seem to count. But it is a problem. Sydney does not recognise working harbour. It doesn't really recognise heritage, to be perfectly honest. We have one of the greatest harbours in the world, but Sydney siders don't really want to know. One of the reasons for that is, well, there's twofold reasons. One is that, that Australia has never had any particular uh, merchant um, service because we, we always relied on foreign ships. So there's no great tradition of seafaring in Australia. The second thing is that the colonial ar arrivals all came by sea. Most of them hated the journey and headed inland as quickly as they could and don't ever want to see the sea again. 
Um, anyway, that's, that's enough of that. Uh, just very quickly and, and running I'm, through I'm going to have to run, you, run you off the table in a minute there, Alan. So, are, are you about done? Yep, sorry. <laughs> just running through the, uh, the, the Roselle side of things. This is a picture which was taken only, only last week. Excuse the mess, we're in the process of reorganising, but it just gives you an idea of the scale of the operation that we've got there. There are two ships which have just... One, one the, the big ferry has just been put up on what we call our Sea Heritage Dock, and she is just about to start restoration. There's a massive job to be done. Her whole hull has to be replated because it's been there since 1912, and uh, it's porous. You can almost sort of see the hull through it. Um, and then we have other, other vessels around, which I'll come to in a minute. We again do the skills transfer. Uh, it should be a nice little welding picture. That's, uh, but we make, we make parts for the vessels ourselves. They're, they're taken apart, they're used as a pattern, and then they will rebuild them. Um, okay. Alan, I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm going to stop. Okay. I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to... Stop. I will stop. I, people always have that strange formula. I'm going to have to. No, I'm going to choose to ask you to stop there, please, Alan, because I have a question for you. Um, it, uh, I also work with Calmar Nickel a lot, which is a volunteer-based organization, and we've always understood that part of the success of that organization has been its dependence on volunteers. The volunteers understand that they are essential to the success of the organization, which is a huge motivating factor both at rec in recruitment and retention. So what percentage or how big a part of your operation are paid staff and how big is it for volunteers? Uh, a paid staff at the moment, we've had a lot of changes with COVID of course, but let's go back to pre-COVID. We had a paid staff of 15 and we have uh, active volunteers to the number of about 450. Okay. So that's, that's, that's similar and they were put in 100,000 hours a year of volunteer oh, okay. work. Okay, very good. And what sort, of, what sort of retention do you see in your volunteer base? Uh, we, getting volunteers in Australia is a challenge. Um, the younger people are too busy running two jobs, families. It's changed a lot over the years. So we tend to think of a young recruit as somebody who's 40. That's very young. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. We do not get, as, as, uh, as Kristen does, the young people. They're not really interested. And particularly with the sort of work we do, it's a little heavy for, for really young people. And we've never been able to successfully hold them. They will come and sail on James Craig, but that's a bucket list thing. They do right. that and then they go off doing something else. Right. Our, our experience on Calmar Nickel is that the majority of our volunteers are younger than 20 or older than 60. Um, which is why most of the riggers who rig Calmer Nickel are 70 plus. It's fun to watch them go up the rigging faster than I can. Um, so thank you very much, Alan. We'll come back to that. Uh, our final presentation is Matthew Tanner, who you've all met already as the president of this organization. But in his spare time, uh, he's the chief executive uh, of the SS Great Britain uh, in Bristol, England. Uh, and I'd like Tim to tell about a new opportunity that's just presented itself to him. Thank you. Thank, is this one, microphone on? Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Fred. And uh, uh, thank you, Alan, too. I'm very sorry that you didn't enjoy your voyage to Australia uh, and your ancestors on a ship as beautiful as this one. Um, but she was, of course, designed to, to bring uh, emigrants all around the world and is now in Bristol in her dry dock and um, the little story that I'm to tell you in the next two or three minutes is really a slightly different in that it's about, it's about uh, not trying to acquire a shipyard in order to help preserve our collection, but rather to uh, go out and preserve a shipyard uh, and uh, maintain it with a view to see what it can do for us as a, an organisation. And uh, we don't indeed maintain the SS Great Britain using traditional techniques at all. She's in a controlled environment, and uh, we do uh, many museum-type things. But what we have uh, never done is to get involved in uh, hands-on shipyard repair activities. Until now, uh, when the opportunity arose, um, you can see the red line there, uh, that's our existing yard, that's the Great Western Dockyard, built by Brunel and colleagues uh, to build 
the world's first great ocean liner, the SS Great Britain. Indeed, the big buildings around were the workshops uh, for uh, creating the steam engines and so forth. But next door was the even older yard, uh, now surrounded by green. Uh, this is the Albion uh, shipyard. Uh, dates from 1820, was the biggest shipyard in Bristol until the late 1970s. Uh, and it limped along until it finally failed about 10 years ago. Um, and the, uh, the opportunity arose to uh, persuade the city council, who had acquired uh, the, the failed yard, that um, their concept that somehow they would be able to sell this yard on the open market uh, was a, a complete non-starter, which of course was, the, was true. The reason it had failed was that to operate a shipyard of this size uh, in the current commercial conditions that have existed for the last uh, um, generation is uh, extremely difficult indeed. It just doesn't stack up. Most of the large dry docks around the west coast of England have now um, failed. Uh, but only by creating a partnership with, uh, with the charity, with the museum, the heritage, uh, could we make a shipyard that, that was actually viable. And so um, we persuaded them to give us the shipyard in return for us creating the investment that would create a, a bigger public value than the uh, sum of its parts. And that's key because the, the yard is actually massive. It's nearly, nearly 200 meters long, this dry dock. Uh, much bigger than any ship that can actually get into Bristol, because it was designed to, to have two ships simultaneously with a dam in the middle. Uh, here uh, you can see we've managed to get the yard working again, uh, invested a fair bit of money, and uh, installed a tenant um, working for the museum, uh, doing basic ship repair. We just built a new hull for this uh, a German freighter that's now a major nightclub in Bristol Harbour. Uh, uh, which is, oh, night, shouldn't knock nightclubs, they're important maritime, as, uh, maritime uses for vessels and so forth. Um, this, this, this dry dock, though, has to uh, generate significant value for uh, the museum. We give the tenant business a very, very low rent. In return, it provides uh, commercial shipyard activities, but in front of the public. And uh, to do that, we have to be able to invest further in the facilities. We have to make sure that they, are, they remain viable. And indeed, business has been very strong indeed over the last uh, three years. Um, we have two tall ships uh, in full refit in there at the moment. But the real vision, as you can see here, is to split the dry dock in half, as originally it was. And the front half, the waterfront half, which is in your bottom right of the screen, it remains as the working shipyard, but in front of the public. We combine the, the two shipyards together, so the Great Western Shipyard with the Great Britain in it is on the left, is combined with the Albion on the right, and we build a full-scale replica of Brunel's Great Western, the first great ocean-going paddle steamer, in the back half of the dock. And what that does is to create a critical mass of uh, visitor experience uh, across the, the, the joined sites that will significantly drive uh, a new business plan for the trust. It creates a more than one day uh, visitor experience. It uh, generates uh, a very positive balance that we can then reinvest in the kind of education programs, the outreach programs that our colleagues have been describing. So uh, this is a kind of symbiotic process uh, whereby the shipyard itself, the working shipyard, could not survive without us uh, controlling the land and giving them a very uh, easy ride on the, on the rent front. In return, they give us the critical mass and the activity of a working shipyard on site and the space to create uh, another great wow, to create a, a significant critical mass of, of visitor experience and museum experiences. Uh, this is an exciting project. It's also extremely expensive and we're right in the throes of securing uh, a very large sum of money, about 25 million. We've got five so far. It's such a good time to be fundraising at the moment, isn't it? Um, but the project is so strong, we're getting very, very uh, uh, warm responses from uh, all, over the, uh, all over the country. And we're very excited. I hope to be able to report uh, further to this Congress in two years' time on our progress. Perfect timing. <clears throat> Now, I have a question for all four of the people who've presented the activity at their yard. 
Every, I think everybody has done a very good job of, of uh, covering what Shane talked about at the beginning, about what the advantages in uh, non -formal, informal education, preservation of skills, transfer of knowledge are. But I'd like to know for each of the different models that you're using, how do you measure whether you're successful or not? Matthew, you want to start? Yes, uh, yes, certainly. And uh, is that on still? Yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, there's, there's two groups to the evaluation of success here. First of all, of course, this is a, a, a significant investment that will drive our bottom line. So uh, we will dr deliver that, uh, that value back into the organization, which we think is based upon doubling the visitor numbers that we currently have. And the market uh, shows that that's quite easily achievable. Uh, the business plan is really very robust for this. Uh, and in terms of my board, of course, that's that's where it's at. That's what it has to deliver, and it's on the back of that those surpluses that drive the uh, the public benefit elements. Um, but to keep the, the dockyard working, of course, we have to keep the flow of, of business coming into the yard, and that could be heritage vessels. We've got two tall ships at the moment, but we're expecting uh, to fill the gaps in the uh, program with commercial vessels. We, we've negotiated a contract with one of the big tug companies at uh, Avonmouth at the moment to have a continual flow. So it doesn't matter whether it's modern ship work or it's more heritage style. It's about the flow and activity in the, the, that it, it generates. So there's a twofold thing. There's the critical mass to drive a significant business plan based on much bigger visitor numbers, double, uh, and keeping the, the viability of the, the commercial shipyard. Okay. Good. As you pointed out to me, in every survey you ask people if they're happy and no one ever says no. So just making people happy is a difficult metric. Alan, how do you measure the success of the program in Sydney Harbour? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question for us because we don't have a commercial arm. Uh, having made the commitment to work with volunteers, it's not possible to take on commercial work. It, it, it's unrealistic in terms of being able to deliver, much as we could do it with the skills because people are volunteers and turn up on a regular basis, you could not achieve the, 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 the work put, uh, throughput. So what we tend to work on is volunteer retention. Ha have we been able to keep volunteers happy? Are they get learning the skills? How many people have we put through courses? How many people have come out with qualifications at the end of the year? That's the, the volunteer side of it. The, the other side, of course, is trying to maintain a budget. I mean, we are a privately run organization. We rely on on funding uh, essentially from uh, sponsors and, and uh, benefactors. We don't get any direct government funding, mainly because we're a locally based organisation. Uh, so it is managing the, the, the cash flow is critical. And if we achieve an end of year where we're still afloat, that's considered to be a successful year. And presumably that James Craig is still afloat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. That, that, that the vessel is still yes. operational. Um, Chris, how, how, do you, how would you measure the success of your operation? Uh, I would look at it in three ways. One, the, the visitor experience is uh, maintaining a, a steady flow of, of new and interesting vessels for our visitors to see being maintained. Uh, a collections management side of allowing us to keep the resources necessary to maintain our own historic fleet. And the third side would be the uh, financial sustainability of helping to bring in some revenue that helps uh, do those other two things. So kind of a three three pronged approach. Okay. And Kristen. Exactly the same three as Chris, but also the numbers of people that come through our education programs from the adult perspective, uh, and now because we are a fully registered. Uh, Shipwright Apprentice Program, the number of apprentices that we can graduate. I think we've graduated three now in the last four years, uh, but also the number of children through Rising Tide, with the hope, of course, being at the moment we're looking at there will be one child who's been right through the last six, seven years who may, who's very, very interested in now joining our Shipwright Apprentice Program, which really makes my heart sing. But also there's Rising Tide children, the ones who started right at the outset. They are now also paid staff for summer camp programs. We have put them through all the certifications they require, first aid, kayaking, CPR, uh, you name it. Uh, and they're now employed staff. Uh, and that 
that to us is a, is a huge success in that regard. Right, and would it be fair to say that a key component of making this work is convincing your funding base yes. that these are viable metrics of success? Yes, and the fact, uh, again, we are a private organization uh, that relies on the largest of the public, uh, which includes our board, uh, we're not state funded. But uh, the, the, we don't, in our applications uh, or our conversations with people, we don't say we put through 200 or 2,000 children through programming. It's in the, it's in the two, two hands. You know, 15 to 20 children uh, a year will be going through the Rising Tide program. And that to us and to our supporters, that is success because you have to try and help one child at a time. Okay. Thank you. Matthew? So is, it, uh, is it fair to say that we're all not state funded in our endeavors here? Uh, I can believe that's point. true. It's a very good point. Yes. So I, I have the luxury of working for a state museum that's not state funded, so, or it wasn't <laughs> until recently, so which is a yeah. completely different <coughs> paradox. Now it's time for the freestyle wrestling part of this program. Uh, and that is uh, any of you in the, who, of the rest of the delegation who would like to ask these folks uh, about their programs or have comments about this idea. I see Deirdre has her hand up. Can someone run quickly with a mic to her? Uh, uh, no, that, people always say that. It didn't work. <laughs> oh, thanks, Howard. Can you be the mic runner for a bit? I don't know how to turn it on. <laughs> okay, can I say something just while we're waiting? Oh, you sure, Shane. Um, no, uh, we were talking about measurement in terms of success and that kind of thing. So I just want to interject while we're doing some stuff there because uh, the Maritime Museum is doing something a little bit different in terms of looking at education and economic outcomes. One of the things that we've been looking at is social and emotional outcomes. And with the youth that we're working with, it's a very different metric because education and economics, you can always tell the, the, the qualifications that someone got or whether you're making dollars and cents on the bottom line. And we've been working very closely with the a sort of a fairly prestigious uh, youth um, academic in New Zealand, Leon Fulcher, who's designed um, a metric called Outcomes That Matter. And we've been implementing that with our um, boat building program that we're doing with local at-risk youth. And we're actually going to be presenting on that at a Teaching with Small Boats conference in uh, Port Townsend, Washington. Because um, oftentimes, you know, the e economic and the educational outcomes are the ones that are, are the most easily measurable, but aren't necessarily the outcomes that have the greatest impact on the individuals that are participating in the programs. So we're really trying to put a, a focus on the social and emotional outcomes that go along with running a yard and having people participate in that space. And I just thought that might be something interesting for people to hear. Yep, thank you. Excellent. My I'd like to just follow that one briefly, which is that uh, it's only in the UK that there are now uh, two different schemes of, that are quantifying well-being and health measures from participation and engagement, which we do use alongside the uh, cash measures. Yes. Um, it's difficult to understand exactly how they relate to our real, real world experiences at this time, but it's certainly a very much a growing element. Yes, it is it's kind of like a, a new version of a triple bottom line, but for yeah. uh, charitable activity. Yeah. Well, we, should, we should chat about that. Mm. Right. Well, let's let Deirdre ask her okay. question. Um, my question is about really directed towards Kristen and Chris is about personnel and I get the impression that your shipyards are fully functioning, very active now, but in the earlier stages were you able to maintain your personnel in between projects or did you have to hire people for a project and then let them go? And are you able to keep your shipwright, shipyard staff engaged with employment year-round at this point? I, I think I can speak for sort of both of us is that on some projects uh, it goes up and down and I think we like to keep a core staff that are able to, uh, you know, the way I think about it is if, if a plank were to spring on the Charles W. Morgan and I were to have to get that hauled out in a day and able to repair it, that I want to make sure I always have the staff on hand to do that kind of a job uh, and ideally be a bit higher than that. But when we did the Mayflower project, we were up to about 26 shipwrights, and right now we're about 12. So it, it does stay, but we like to keep a core. And post Dove contract, uh, the, our, a number of our Dove staff were on contract rather than employees per se. 
uh, and a number of those have, have moved on, uh, but a number also stayed. So we've got a reduced number now as well, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fully staffed shipyard. In fact, I think we've got one or two vacancies at the moment. We always, this is the hard part of staffing a shipyard. It is becoming even more difficult, and I'm sure you're finding this too, even more difficult to find the staff with these traditional skills, which is why it's absolutely imperative that we as organizations and yourselves create the opportunities to keep practicing and strengthening these skill sets. Otherwise, none of these vessels is going to be able to function, the Craig, etc. They're going to be great photographs and posters on people's walls, but they're, and they're going to be great memories, but that's it. They are not going to be able to continue without these skill sets. And that's our responsibility as maritime museums in this world to continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank yep. you. So, we've got a question here uh, from Paddy. I just wondered if uh, any of you had tried working with hard to reach uh, young groups or young offenders, and if so, what your experiences have been. Uh, I'll just quickly say that uh, it's, it's a challenge. We, we learned, uh, particularly with Rising Tide, that, and even some of our shipwright apprentices, that a number of them do come uh, with family challenges, emotional challenges. We are not equipped to be able to support those, those individuals. Uh, we have fantastic resources in our community that we can draw upon, uh, and we have done so when necessary. But it's, it's a big challenge. We, we've tried um, uh, programs with both young offenders and older ones. And I have to say that neither of them work for exactly the same reason that, that Kristen's raised, that you spend more time um, managing or supervising and stopping emotional problems often uh, than you ever do building boats. And the, the strain on, on staff, but because you can't, you can't run that sort of program on, on volunteers, the strain on staff is considerable. And so we've had to give it up, although it, you know, in, in principle you wish you could. It just isn't a feasible proposition without proper staff dedicated to doing it, and that is a completely different thing to what maritime museums do. And if I could add to that, yes, we do do that. We've been doing it for about 10 years. It's been very successful, but it depends upon uh, two or three very highly experienced quality staff, which are, in fact, funded by the state through the UK Probation Service. Uh, so effectively, we're taking offenders uh, who uh, you might call uh, are at a point in their lives where they can start to re-engage with society and with the right support uh, they come out and work with us in our workshops, not in, the, not in the shipyard yet, in our workshops working on our display maintenance and general maintenance work uh, and we've employed three of them in that 10 year, ten year cycle ourselves. Uh, watching them grow and, and uh, escape from their past has been fantastic. But it requires the very experienced, high-quality staff. It stopped for three years because we lost, tragically lost one of those members of staff. Um, and uh, it requires careful selection of the people that are coming through. So it's not just, um, it's not a chain gang. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the experience of the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. We have run, I would argue, a very successful program, but again, partnering with a very strong local community organization that works with marginalized and at-risk youth. Um, I think that having the specialized uh, individuals to work with the youth um, almost on a one-on-one -on -one ratio is, is really imperative. Um, in my presentation, I spoke about being able to tell different stories about yourself. Um, I do think that the boat building does provide a fantastic opportunity to work on those social and emotional spaces where students may not have fit into the traditional mold of education that I was talking about and the intuitive knowledge has been dismissed but within the context of the boatyard and the informal learning process that happened there they're able to meet the, some social and emotional outcomes as well as build boats that allows them to reconstitute and 
create different narratives for their own lives. I actually wrote a, a, an article where we spoke about culpable categorization and, and part of that was when we view young people as dangerous then you know we we've sort of got that pre um, I forget the name of it like a, a foregone conclusion like we we've already constructed that narrative for them and what boat building allows these used to be able to do is to really challenge that preconceived notion that the broader society has of them as of being at risk or delinquent or whatever it happens to be and they can start believing their own story, which is the story of being creative as opposed to destructive. So I think that's an interesting. I, I, I think we have time for one more question and before, and we do have one more. Can question. I throw our side of that uh, <laughs> question? Yeah, yeah, good, sure. So we have, uh, not shipyard specific, but we do have a center for experiential education that ties in sort of all aspects of the museum into uh, at-risk youth and bringing them into the fold that includes boat building as well as other you know, developmental stuff is, and tying into the museum at, as a whole. And while we love to get some of them uh, into the shipyard. We don't totally tie that in quite yet. Okay, thanks. David Denham from the tall ship Glenlee, probably aimed more, more at Alan. Um, you say that your volunteer base gets progressively older. How do you deal with, a, do you find that you have to deal with the um, older volunteer who becomes actually a risk to himself because you're no longer use, useful to be playing with the, with the big saws or anything else. And at the age of 98, how do you turn that sort of person off? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. <laughs> um, yeah, when, when you, yes, we, we have... Um, let, I'm just trying to think how old he'd be now. I think he'd probably be about 86 or 87. We've got one deckhand on James Craig who still climbs the rig. So, you know, it, it ranges. It was a very interesting study done, a uh, postgraduate study done only a couple of years ago, where uh, they took a group of our volunteers, all over the age of 80, and we have quite a number of them, uh, and looked at what difference coming to work at the shipyard was making to their lives. And it was absolutely fascinating. The, the, the decline in medical requirements, uh, their, their social attitude was better, uh, their emotional attitude was better compared with a, a, a panel of um, equal people from the community. And so, yes, it is a problem. They get to a certain point and they realise the sort of work we do, you, you, you know, you just say, I, I've had enough. But we do have a, if you like, a sort of a postgraduate group that meet regularly in the pub and, uh, you know, they have lunch together and things like that. So we're able to keep a social feeling going that they're not being neglected and we have many days when they come back and take part in activities but yes it does take a little bit of managing when they get to a point where they're not really able to um, offer skills and the big problem is of course the danger uh, we are working with steam and heights and machinery and all that sort of thing and you have to be very very careful um, I mean it's the same with visitors we, we have the same problem with getting visitors too close to what we do because it's dangerous work in many cases. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, Alan, Shane, Chris, Kristen, and uh, Matthew. Uh, we've come to the end of our budgeted time, if not a little bit over. Uh, I believe I'll hand off to Kim, who will give you the directions and specifics on what we're going to do next. Thank you very much.